Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Doyle, and I am a co-founder and the Vice President of Customer Success and Support here at InspectPoint. I am going to be moderating today's presentation. Um, we are and might have some more people joining on, but I did want to introduce today, I am joined by Todd Stevens. He is the project manager for the Special Hazards FP group at JC Canestraro. Uh, he has a lot of great information he's going to share with us today. But before I turn it over to him, I do just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, at the end of today's presentation, we're going to have roughly 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, so if you have any questions that you would like to ask Todd uh, at the end of today's presentation, make sure to drop them into the chat area on your GoToWebinar control panel or whatever you're seeing on the side of your screen. Um, drop them there and we will get through as many of them as we can. Um, everyone is muted, so that is the best place to put those questions. Um, if we do not get through all of the questions, um, they will be addressed through email. So um, if you do ask one, you will get an answer for it um, either live or through email. Um, so that's all I have for housekeeping. Um, so without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Todd, and he is going to walk us through today's presentation. So Todd, it's all you. Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and um, uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, thanks to everybody online listening today. I'm excited to be here um, and excited to have all of you here to listen a little bit about expanding your business and do special hazards. Um, before I dive in, I do want to point out that the concept and the ideas that I'm going to present in, in these slides um, really can can be utilized for any type of business or direction that you're trying to head into uh, as far as a business. I know a lot of you listening are in the realm of fire protection, or I believe that you are uh, with our host of Inspect Point and so forth. Um, so you may be a special hazard business that's listening to this presentation. You can use the same tools that I'm gonna provide if you're interested more in getting into uh, the sprinkler business, for example. Um, so, you know, we are going to focus a little bit more on the special hazards, the second half, but please know that the tools I provide, um, hopefully you'll be able to, all, all of you will be able to take something away from uh, this presentation. So with the agenda, um, we're going to go through basically starting a special hazard division. I'm going to do my four W's, the why, what, where, and when. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about spe selling special hazards. If you're going down that road, how to um, get the word out that you are in the special hazard industry. Of course, we'll spend some time talking a little bit about inspection, testing, and maintenance. And I also wanted to talk touch on unique technologies. Uh, and the reason for that is if you're listening and you dabble a little in special hazards or you're not sure if you want to get more involved in special hazards, there may be a, a, a certain technology out there that would be perfect for your owner. Um, so I wanted to just highlight a couple of the, the newer things that we're seeing in our industry uh, that might spark some interest from all of you. And again, as Jennifer mentioned, if you have some questions, uh, please don't hesitate to, to throw them into the chat and we'll, um, we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. So I wanted to start with um, this quote, one of my favorite quotes. And the quote says, you can't expect to meet the challenges of today with yesterday's tools and expect to be in business tomorrow. And I came across this quote a couple of years ago and it really, I think is perfect for um, what we do in our industry of technology and so forth. Um, you know, it's, with the market changes and with our economy, the way it moves and flows, uh, we really need to adapt and we need to adjust to those changes. Uh, it's important to diversify ourselves uh, as businesses and as companies. It's important to flow with the current as it changes, but it's also important to know when you may have to jump stream, if you will, uh, and try something different in order to continue to move forward. I always hated that phrase, um, that's the way we've always done it, right? We've hear, we hear that from certain people, and I can almost guarantee you those people that say that uh, are not driven like we are. They're not driven to move forward. They're not driven to succeed and build upon what they have. Uh, they just want to maintain what they do, what they did yesterday, um, 
and and they're not really going to learn from from what they did uh, and apply that to businesses tomorrow. So it's always important to to look for those um, new tools that are going to help you move forward in the future. And I'm almost certain that none of you thought I would get through an entire presentation without at least mentioning COVID-19 at least once. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring it up is because COVID-19 has opened our eyes and forced us to really revisit our plans, our market plans, our business plans. Uh, some of us have thrived based on the changes in COVID-19 and others have, have struggled with the changes that have occurred. Um, we look at restaurants. I use that as an example. Uh, there's three groups of restaurants. There's a, a sit-down only restaurant, there's a takeout only restaurant, and then a restaurant that does both. Now for a sit-down only restaurant, they've really had to adjust in today's market. They've had to learn a whole new concept of takeout and dealing with different delivery services and new menus and that sort of thing. So they've really adapted to today's society. The takeout, not they, if they only did take out, um, they're at a benefit, but they still have to learn um, different ways because now they have more competition than they did in originally. Um, so again, my point is, is that adapting to the economy and the everyday events is really, really important for us. All right, so let's get into the meat of some things and let's talk about why it's uh, a good idea to start a special hazard division or again, any division within your company. So business growth, that's an obvious one, right? Um, hopefully if you're in business, um, again, you are you have goals in front of you and you have ideas of hitting certain sales marks or revenue marks and you may be plateaued a little bit, you may be feeling that you know, you're at where you're at with the expertise that you're in, the idea of expanding into a different division um, may help take you to that next level. So it's going to assist with that business growth. A course of diversity, and we talked about that a, a couple of minutes ago, um, diversity is important within a company. You want to be able to, again, flow with the changes in the market um, where some of your divisions may be down and other divisions may be up during certain times of economy. Uh, it's important to diversify so you have a little bit of a taste of everything. And customer service, obviously. Um, customer is a, who we listen to, right? If we want to expand and grow, we want to listen to what our customers' needs are. We want to be that one-stop shop, maybe all trades. Um, we want to be able to answer the question yes to matter, no matter what they ask us to do. Um, but it's also important, and I, I want to caution you, if you have 100 customers and five of them have a special hazard service need, um, it may not be the best model for you to go down that road because it's such a low percentage of, of your customers' needs. But if you have 100 customers and, and 85 to 90 of them um, do have that special hazard need, that's when you want to start questioning, hmm, if I get into this and I become an expert in that direction, not only is it going to help my business, but it's also going to help my current customer base. I threw margins in there, just knowing the sprinkler world and, and some other um, uh, other avenues. Uh, special hazards does have uh, inherently uh, higher margins with the equipment. It's a little bit more technical and involves a little bit more design and thought process. Um, so the margins tend to be slightly higher than a standard, let's say, sprinkler contractor or a sprinkler contract. And of course, inspection, testing, and maintenance. Um, it's again, going back to that customer being the one-stop shop or just providing that service for uh, new customers as well. So the first thing that you, you really need to do if you're looking to expand to special hazards or expand your business in any realm is write a business plan. Um, I, I can't stress that enough and it, it amazes me when I talk to different companies that say, hey, we're doing this now. And uh, you know, I ask, well, did you sit down and write a business plan? And they say, no, well, what, what's that all about? <laughs> and sometimes if you go to the bank and you're getting a loan from the bank for a business loan, they do require a business plan. But even if not, even if it's a small division in your company, I think it's really important to spend the time to write that business plan. So I wanted to, to take a minute and go through some of this with you. So business plans can really be written in a number of different ways. 
uh, there's a lot of different um, categories that you can add and subtract and you really need to tailor that business plan to your business but you know the general concepts of this this plan really work for a lot of different avenues you want to have an executive summary and that executive summary really should explain what your intent is with this plan um, what are you looking to do by starting a new division or a new company um, I add in their product lines, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few slides, but that's a key element to a special hazard business is the product lines that they carry. Um, so I think it's important to include that in a business plan. Market analysis. Where is your opportunity? I can guarantee you if you sit down to write a business plan and you get to that market analysis and you realize that you can't write more than two sentences in that portion, well, guess what? It might not be a good opportunity for you. Um, you really need to analyze your, your existing customer base, analyze the market, and, and truthfully uh, convince yourself, sell yourself that this is a good idea. Sales strategy. Again, I have another slide that will get more in depth on sales strategy. Um, organization and management, operations. People don't always think about the, the fact of the importance, important level of in your head designing um, who is going to do the work and how many men do you need based on the amount that you're selling okay so you know and again we'll talk about it a little bit later as far as the different portions but technicians and designers and project managers um, have an idea in that business plan that hey if I'm going to sell four million dollars a year how many project managers is it going to take to get that work completed? How many designers am I gonna need to design those systems for that sale base? So that's an important element to sit down and figure out. And then of course, the financial look ahead. Maybe you're writing this business plan to present it to an owner of the company you work for. Um, the CFO is definitely gonna wanna spend some time talking to you about the financial side of things and the look ahead. They wanna know what your expectations are. So a first year and then of course a, a, a three to five year plan is really important to, to sell the idea. And again, it's an indication to you to determine if this is an actual good idea or not, or a good plan. Can't stress enough, Re repeat this process every year. If you start a, a division or a business uh, and you write a business plan a year later, reread the business plan that you wrote and then start from scratch and write it again okay and the reason for that is you'll write things into your business plan and and from the standpoint of marketing analysis and sales strategy a year later you've learned a lot and that sales strategy may be totally different or or it may have changed your market analysis may be different you may say hey i want to go and do a lot of marine work and in that first year, you realize that that's really not a good avenue for you. On that second year business plan, you want to scratch that, right? And relook at what that a new analysis is. So I, again, super important to redo a business plan on a yearly basis. It helps to keep you on track. All right, so partnerships and vendors. So special hazards works a little different than some of the other trades out there um, you know a, a lot of us can go out and buy pipe and fittings from a number of different vendors and we we do have partnerships and relationships with those people but they'll sell pipe and fittings to almost anybody but with special hazards when you get into these vendors that are going to sell you special hazard equipment you need to often become an actual distributor of their equipment so we call these vendors OEMs or original equipment manufacturers and a lot of times in the process of, of developing a special hazard division you want to sit down and dis, th have a discussion with that OEM and get some different guidelines in place there's always a distributor agreement um, you know a lot of times the distributor is going to require you and your staff to have some training specific to the manufacturer and be ma manufactured certified which makes you basically a, a true distributor of that product you, they want you to be the experts of their product um, in service and installation and, and everything um, of course the basics the credit terms um, are going to be discussed expectations sales expectations 
what is the OEM looking for you to sell on a yearly basis? Um, you know, that's important too. If you could sit down with a particular OEM and they say, hey, we're expecting you to sell $6 million a year and you did your business plan and you know you're only planning on selling maybe $4 million a year total, um, you know you can't meet their expectations. So be clear about what their expectations are and what you can uh, provide them. Market boundaries. Um, where can I sell this equipment? If I'm a customer in Arkansas and I, if I'm told, hey, you can sell this equipment in Arkansas and I call my local rep and say, I just got a job in uh, Tennessee. Can I sell and install that system in Tennessee? Some manufacturers, it's not a problem. Other manufacturers, they may have limitations to where you can sell and install that product. So again, just understand those boundaries. Super important customer support, technical support. You know, you're learning their product line. Um, they're learning your business. You wanna work together and it's important to know that they have a solid customer support and technical support. And that follows up with the sales rep. Um, I can't stress enough the importance of having a good sales rep with your OEM, being able to answer questions, being able to be there when you call them, uh, being able to, to and I, I put in their market support because a lot of times we'll work with our sales reps to go and do engineering calls or to do presentations as a team um, to sell that product line. And one thing I've learned over the years is truly to listen to your OEM sales rep. And no, I don't think my sales reps are listening, so I'm not getting any money for this, but they do truly have a lot to say. And what I mean by that is they know their product line better than anybody. You need to listen to them because they're not just trying to sell you a product. They're trying to help you sell their product to somebody else. If that makes sense, and, and, and I'll say it another way, they, they want you to buy equipment, obviously it's gonna benefit them, but that's gonna help us have something in front of us that we can sell our customers. So if we're an expert at what they have, it's gonna help us sell better to our customers. And they may have a unique technology that you didn't know about before that you can say, hey, I know just the customer that will benefit from that. So spend time to develop that relationship with your OEM sales rep. It's super important. And again, be the expert in this specific market. You really need to look at all the avenues of being the expert. You don't wanna just do a half job. You don't wanna do 50% just because again, a small percentage of your customers need it. So you say, well, I'm only gonna put 10% effort into it because only 5% of my customers have special hazard needs. No, that's not the right move. Be the complete expert of everything in that market that you're they're following towards. Every state is different. I'm not gonna um, assume anything with where you are or what your requirements are but make sure you understand what the licensing is of each state. And I say that because again, I don't want everybody to run off and say, oh, well, Todd said I could start a special hazard business and you start installing systems. Look at what the state requires you to do for company license and even in um, personal license. You know, the technicians and the designers that are out there doing the work. What are the requirements by the state, by local uh, officials? What are the requirements of the manufacturers? Um, you know, that's important to, to be aware of. And if you are hiring technicians and designers, you know, ask some of those questions. Do they have any manufacturer certifications? You know, you've worked out a deal with a specific OEM. Does that technician you're bringing on board, is he familiar with that OEM? That could be helpful in, in kind of jump starting the process. NYSET certifications, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with NYSET, the National Institute for Certification Engineering Technologies, um, and FSSA, uh, which is the Fire Suppression Systems Association, specific for special hazards, has an amazing online training program. If you are talking to a designer or a technician that tells you that they've been through the FSSA online training program, hire them immediately. Um, you'll definitely, you'll, you won't regret it, and they are definitely a value to our industry. And project managers, sales team, Again, 
this is a whole package. They're all certain, certainly important, and they have certain needs as well. And and they may, you know, have gone through some of those FSSA training programs or NICET certifications, and they should also be manufacturer certified so that they understand what they're trying to sell. But it's about building a team, right? Um, you know, you you want to be able to uh, again be the expert in this market. You want to be the best that you can be. Um, you know, it's m sometimes important to have a narrower path than a wide cast net. Uh, focus on it and build that team of experts uh, to make sure that you're successful with it. Get involved in your market. Another key element to building any type of business. Um, I'm just throwing a few up there and, and I apologize if, I, if I've missed. I know there's a lot of trade associations out there, but specific to our needs and the fire uh, protection realm, you got your um, alarm association, NFSA, AFSA, SFPE, FSSA, uh, and NFPA, obviously. All these, these organizations have great training programs, great documentation, uh, great information, uh, resources to reach out and, and look for more information. So get involved in whether it's a local chapter or a national chapter, and um, you know that will definitely help you be that expert in your market. All right, so enough of the business chat. Let's, let's focus a little bit more on the special hazard side, the why, what, where, and when. My four W's. So if we look at why use special hazards, and special hazards again is, is a lot of different products and we'll talk about the products in a bit, but ultimately when we think of special hazards, we think of something um, that is unique to the standard fire protection systems. We're using systems that will prevent a lot of damage scenarios or will help in a fire event to minimize the downtime, okay? If we specifically talk about uh, clean agents, which could be chemical agents or inert gases, gas type suppression systems, when they discharge, they're gonna put the fire out, not damage any equipment and minimize that downtime from the event. We use special hazards in general, whether it's protection or detection, uh, when the contents as well as the building protection is required. So we're not necessarily using special hazards to protect the building, we're using special hazards to protect what's inside the building, okay? Your customer has that super expensive device or, or um, property inside an element, whether it's storage or whether it's a, um, you know, we'll get into the, some of the uh, wear here in a minute, um, but they're really looking at protecting their assets. Valuable commodities, irreplaceable products, um, protective of area, protecting areas that are possibly water reactive to chemicals, um, or, or excuse me, water reactive chemicals that you're trying to protect. Uh, you may be able to better off protect them with other gaseous type systems. And three dimensional shielded objects. A gaseous system uh, works around corners and obstructions. It's not like a sprinkler spray pattern that, that can be obstructed by different items. Um, this is more three-dimensional, working around different things. So these are some of the reasons why we would typically use special hazards. And the key buzzword really is business interruption. We all have customers that talk about um, if their data center goes down, they're going to you know, lose X amount of money every minute. Okay, And I say X amount because I've heard all sorts of actual numbers thrown out there, and it's, it's, it really depends on the business. But nobody wants an interruption in their business. Okay, so if we can prevent that business interruption and give them the protection that they need for their equipment, um, that's a huge advantage. And that's what, what special hazards really is all about. So what is special hazards? Well, we can talk about chemical agents. So chemical agents, um, you know, I, I put the chemical name on the left and in the parentheses you have uh, some of the more known terminologies, FM200, ACARO, Novec 1230. Um, chemical agents are a clean agent um, and chemical agents are a manufactured product. And that manufactured product is um, housed in tanks, 
normally super pressurized with nitrogen um, and when discharged push through the piping and exit it out of a nozzle um, as a gas to help extinguish that fire. Now a lot of these are really focusing on the cooling aspect of a fire and um, breaking down the chemical reaction. I didn't put my fire tetrahedron up there, but that's that's ultimately what a chemical agent is doing is it's removing the heat portion and attacking the, the uh, chemical reaction. Your inert gases, a little different. You have your IGs, um, you have some blends, you have some straight uh, inert gases uh, at some different pressures as well. And again, what these uh, elements are gonna do, they're not necessarily manufactured gases. These are gases that we're breathing in the atmosphere right now that we're pulling out and we're putting into a cylinder and we're utilizing them to offset uh, in a space to either lower the oxygen content to a point where combustion cannot occur. So it's attacking the fire a little bit differently, um, but it's still a gas. And uh, again, it's still gonna be something that's not gonna leave any residue. It's gonna be electrically non-conductive and it's it's gonna provide um, a little to no cleanup, all right? And what I, I'll mention again too is, and after chemical agents and inert gas, uh, we have some pressures there. And the, there is a variety of different pressures that can be designed in these cylinders, and each manufacturer has some different things as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that and the unique technologies, um, but just know that every manufacturer has some different options in reference to that. CO2. Another special hazard product. Uh, we still do see a lot of CO2 used in different applications and industrial applications and such. Um, that does get into more of a um, complete uh, extinguishment of the, the oxygen content within a space. Uh, so we have to be cautious if we're using it for a full flood application. We do need to be cautious about where we're using that and the proper um, guidelines for that. And then I always list these items a little bit separately. They are, in my mind, special hazard, but they are a water-based product as well. We have water mist, you have um, hybrid type systems, and you have foam, okay? Why do I mix those in with special hazards? Well, one, they do seem to be a little bit more technically uh, involved than a, a basic sprinkler system. Uh, again, they follow different NFPA guidelines than uh, your standard sprinkler system. So if we look at, you have NFPA 13, which a lot of our sprinkler contractors are, are very familiar with. When we get into chemical agents and inert gases, that follows NFPA 2001. If we're getting into water mist, it's NFPA 750. Um, so there's different NFPA guidelines for these things. So it's a little bit more unique than a standard sprinkler system. And hence the reason I kind of lump them all in as, as special hazards. Continuing with what is special hazards, we always joke about the fact that uh, electricity and water don't mix, right? So, you know, again, I was sprinkler designer for years and, um, you know, if it had fire alarm to it, I'd throw my hands up and say, nope, not our job. But when it comes to special hazards, it really does come in hand in hand. So not only is the protection portion, what we're using to protect the space important, but the detection portion is, is just as important. We do, in special hazards, get more involved in the fire alarm side. We're not necessarily full electricians or fire alarm contractors, but we often have technicians on board that can um, program control panels, that can um, be aware of how to set these systems up and commission different uh, types of detection. So detection and controls is a portion of it. We have heat and smoke detection, air sampling detection, Video smoke is, an, is a popular detection um, lately. Linear heat detection, flame detection, gas detection, and as well as all the associated elements that go along with that. And what I mean by that is the um, horns and strobes, pull stations, abort buttons, all those um, additional accessories are all part of that special hazard system. So it is important, again, that you know this isn't just a special hazards is not just about pipe and fittings it is about the intelligent detection side as well and knowing which detection is the best for the application so be aware of that if you're going to get involved in it 
and where are special hazards used, different applications. Um, this could be a, a slide that just goes on forever, to be completely honest. Um, the number one, I think, answer, if we if we were to do a, a family feud scenario, and, and number one answer for the most, um, you know, application using special hazards, it would be a data center, a computer room. And everybody truly has one, okay? So whether it's, um, it's uh, whether it is a, um, a, a 100,000 square foot data center or a two by two closet, um, it's really, uh, everybody has valuable information that's super important to them that they want to protect, okay? So that's that's something to think about. File storage, museums, art galleries. These are more scenarios that are um, artifacts that are irreplaceable. Okay, um, you know, especially in a museum or library, uh, irreplaceable artifacts that if there is a fire condition, um, it's it it you're not going to be able to save it. If if you know if a water uh, sprinkler system activates, it could do more damage than good. Um, file storage, that sort of thing. So we want to protect those with special hazards. More industrial applications, uh, warehouses, um, anaconic chambers. When we get into foam, we deal a lot more with aircraft hangars and helipads, uh, LNG video, uh, vapor mitigation, uh, situations where we're not using foam to extinguish a, a fire, uh, or using foam to more prevent a fire from occurring during an LNG uh, leak, if you will. Okay. Um, Wind turbines, rare car storage, I always throw in there in the end. I had a job years ago where a gentleman came to us and said, hey, we want to protect um, my garage. I have a rare car storage of a number of cars, and he wanted to protect it. And we said, sure, well, we can put in a, a wet sprinkler system. He said, nope. He goes, I don't want water in there. I don't want to damage my cars. Um, and we actually protected his um, garage with a uh, clean agent system. So that was really interesting, it was fun. But we're, the point of all this is when we get into applications, there's a very limited scenarios of where you can use it. Um, of course, not every special hazard system is correct for every single application, but every application, um, there's always some type of special hazard system that would work to properly protect. And lastly, the when portion. When do we plan to use special hazards? I always get the, the question about, um, I'll back up for a minute, uh, as far as code requirements, okay? Um, building codes often tell us that we need to sprinkle a building per NFPA 13. NFPA 13 doesn't tell you when to sprinkle the building, it just tells you if you are going to do it, this is how. And the same thing with our standards as well. No code is gonna tell you to put clean agent system in, or excuse me, the NFPA standards isn't gonna tell you when to put it in, they're gonna tell you if you are putting it in, how to do that. But there really isn't a lot of codes out there that tell you you have to put in special hazards. So a lot of it comes from the owner. Similar to my story a moment ago, the gentleman had a rare car storage. He knew that he didn't wanna put water in there, but he had there was some sort of fire protection that he wanted to provide. So a lot of times the owner knows that they have a unique application and they want something outside of the norm to help protect it. An engineer may, you know, confront the owner or, or the engineer may be involved and say, hey, you know, you have this really expensive piece of equipment. Let's try protecting this with um, a special hazard system. Or the owner may go to the engineer and already know what he wants for that and say, this is what I'm looking for. So they kind of work hand in hand as well. And even contractors, um, you know, we're all involved in this process um, because a lot of codes don't necessarily require these systems. We're all trying to help each other understand where they're gonna work best and where there's an advantage to using this system. So all three of these, these individuals kind of play off each other and have the opportunity to work together to develop that proper um, system uh, the type of system, the type of detection, the right application, uh, and and to help through that process. So that's kind of the win.
So if we take a step back and talk about selling special hazards. So we're starting a new division. Um, we have an existing customer base. Uh, what are our options here? How do we go about doing that? Um, and this really, I, I, I already talked about it. <laughs> our special hazard systems required by code? Uh, generally not. So again, we are upselling a lot of times in a scenario. You may still be required to have a sprinkler system. Special hazards don't always eliminate the fact that you need a sprinkler system and you need to make sure you have that conversation with your local officials or state officials before you do that. It doesn't always replace. It often is an addition to, okay? So be aware of that. You know, you, you know, you can't try to sell somebody on something if you're not aware of what the code requirements are and what the um, advantages are of the system. But your existing customers really are your low hanging fruit. They may not know what special hazards are. You're in their building every day. You, you know their building, you know their site, you know what they, what they do and what their commodities are. Um, that's your opportunity to really sell them on the idea of, hey, you know, this is a great opportunity for some air sampling smoke detection. Let's get some early warning smoke detection uh, in this particular space. Um, let's put a foam system that, you know, let's start looking into, you know, what this hazard is uh, and work with your customers on that sense. The bid work. That might be another avenue if you start a new business and you say, hey, I don't really have any customers. How do I get into this? Well, um, bidding through an estimating department or you may be the estimating department in a lot of cases. Um, there's a lot of sites out there that you can start to navigate through and find some information on special hazard systems and special hazard bids that are out there. Relationships, again, it goes back to your existing customers and just knowing people. Um, you would be amazed at how much happens in a trade association meeting, the conversations, the interaction. That's what I mean by relationships, being involved in the industry, and you never know when um, that individual on the other side of the table you're talking to may need your services, and vice versa. It works both ways. Um, so, you know, it's, again, staying involved in the industry and developing those relationships. Engineering support. Definitely. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, visit with engineers. I know, you know, if you're a contractor, a lot of contractors kind of chuckle when they hear that and say, well, what am I going to teach an engineer? Well, a lot of engineers aren't as knowledgeable about special hazards as they are some other directions. Okay. So it is important to visit with them and sit down and say, hey, my company offers this service. We can help you. Let's help you write the specification. Let's, let's get the right special hazard product into your specifications. Some companies uh, have FPEs on staff. Uh, some of you contractors listening today may have an, a, an FPE or two on staff and you know can get involved in more of a design build application. Um, design build is more, again, you're, you're, you're given more of a conceptual design, an idea, and you're working directly with the owner to say, hey, this is what we can do, and these are some of the options that I have that, that we can talk about. And it's, it's important whenever you're selling special hazards to really think outside the box with technology. And, you know, years ago, a lot of you on this call may be, you know, familiar with Halon. Halon doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we're hearing about it, I think, less and less as we continue to move forward. Um, but so many people jumped on that Halon bandwagon and they say, some of the older gentlemen say to me, well, it's special hazards isn't what it was before. Well, they're right, it's not. Going back to the very beginning of this presentation, we have to uh, move and, and, and move with the current and adapt and diversify ourselves. You really have to think outside of the box about what you can sell in special hazards. Um, back to the, the um, different applications, wind turbines, okay? Uh, you know, in Europe, every wind turbine in Europe has fire protection in it. Um, we're trying to get in that direction here in the US. There are a lot of wind turbines that do have fire protection, but it's not necessarily a, a requirement. But again, that's the outside of the box thinking um, that you need to uh, train your staff and your employees in selling special hazards. 
and I am certainly not a marketing major, <clears throat> but I do know that marketing is important. And again, you may be the marketing team and the sales team and the project manager and the designer all rolled in one. Um, but it, it is, I mean, I'm not an old gentleman, but I'm not young either. And social media really does have an effect on our daily lives for all of us. So it is important to get that information out on social media, um, educate the industry that you're involved in, in special hazards, uh, keep them up to date on some of the things that you're doing. Uh, you know, it's, it's really, social media is a really a great tool um, to expanding your business and marketing your business. You know, you can always add case studies, you can do blogs, company websites, um, you know, all that stuff is important to, um, to, to keep moving forward and, and continue growth with your business. And I know InspectPoint is our host for today's webinar, so I think they'd be a little disappointed if I did not mention inspection, testing, and maintenance. Not gonna go into a great lot of detail here, but just to throw up some things, um, you know, what do you need to know? Let's say you're getting into special hazards, and your customer has a special hazard system and you say, well, I want to get into the ITM contract on this. Um, it is important, and I don't have it on that list, but it is important to be well aware of the, the product that is installed and the manufacturer that it, that it is and know their product line, okay? It's okay to say to your customer, you know what? Yes, we do that, those, that type of system, but we're not familiar with that manufacturer's uh, requirements, um, they may need to look at using somebody else or take that opportunity to look into it and get that information. But, um, you know, again, every manufacturer is so different. It's important to understand what it is that you're um, testing or inspecting. Just some of the basic things to look for. You want to, uh, you know, the first time there, you want to get a good grasp of the details, the as-built drawings possibly. You want to see some flow calculations, verify that none of the piping has changed or anything. Um, in the inspection, test, and maintenance portion, a lot of it is the detection and controls. You're detecting, testing the, the smoke detectors, uh, the pull stations, the ports, those sort of things. Um, you need to look at room integrity. We're not going to get into a lot of detail today about room integrity, but you know, year a year or every six months that you're in there, you want to look at that room and make sure if it is supposed to be a tightly sealed room based on a clean agent or inert gas system, you want to make sure it stays that way. Um, so understand the room integrity requirements. And then your basic container inspection, um, which we'll look at here in a second. And even most importantly is understand the system operation. And if the owner doesn't understand the order of operations and you learn what it is, help him understand because it is super important for you both to, to know how the system is supposed to operate properly. I'm going to fly through a few of these slides, but when you look at cylinders, this was just some example. Um, you look at cylinders, it'll tell you what agent is in that cylinder. It should tell you the amount of weight, the tar weight, the agent weight, the full weight. And you need to verify that the weight of that cylinder uh, hasn't changed uh, from inspection to inspection. Some of the older systems actually mark it right on the valve itself. It may not have a label. That's why I threw these photos up. You, you got to look at the, the, the valve and, and see where they've stamped into it, uh, what the weights are. And then you want to obviously check your gauges um, and your liquid level indicators. And if it doesn't have a liquid level indicator for you know certain systems, you um, are going to want to pick that tank up and put it on a scale and verify the weight. That's all super important stuff. As well as checking the integrity of that tank. If you find rust on it or you know um, you know dents or scratches or whatever the case may be, uh, you want to visually inspect it and make sure that there's no issues from that perspective. Now that certainly was not a presentation on inspection, testing, and maintenance. So you can, we can get really more in depth than that, but that's just kind of a quick highlight of some things you need to, um, you would assume you'd need to get involved in with these systems. <clears throat> All right, couple couple more slides here on some unique technologies. I'll I'll fly through these a little bit so we can give some opportunity for some questions. So if you do have some questions, please go go right ahead and start throwing those in the chat. 
special hazards. We talked about foam. This is a big topic lately, um, and foam testing specifically. We're struggling in our industry with the concerns of foam concentrate, environmentalist, uh, um, environmental impact and concerns. Again, now is not the platform to get into the details of it, but when you test your proportioner, your foam proportioner properly, you need to test it and you are going to flow foam or create a foam solution. In order, you can't just take that foam solution and dump it down a drain. It needs to be discharged uh, properly and it may require environmental consideration. There may be cleanup involved, uh, proper disposal, and it can be extremely costly in some cases. On top of the environmental impact and the cleanup and disposal, you've dumped foam. So now you have to go back and you need to replace the concentrate that you just utilized for that test. That's some additional cost as well. Some new technologies out there. There's a water-driven proportioner that allows you to do the full test, flowing water only and not actual solution. So you're not wasting concentration and you're not, you don't have that cost impact for foam uh, collection and disposal. You can save a ton of money on commissioning as well as your yearly testing. The reason I like these proportioners is we can test them and there's no concerns. We have customers, unfortunately, that just physically do not want to test their foam proportioner because of the costs involved. And, you know, we, we really want to do our due diligence and test this equipment properly. So that's one unique technology that's out there in the foam industry. With clean agent systems and inert gases, I touched on it a little bit with the different pressures. Uh, 360, 500 PSI, 725 PSI inert gases, a 200 or even a 300 bar system. As we start to increase these pressures, and, and again, I encourage you to look at the different manufacturers' requirements and how their valves are built and designed and what those outlet pressures are. But at the end of the day, the higher pressures provide some different opportunities for you in design. You often have optimized usage of the container volume. You can put more agent in a container if you have a higher um, pressure. Sometimes you're using fewer or uh, cylinders or even smaller cylinders, like you see in the picture on the right. You know, that line of where the, the color changes, the bottom portion is our agent. It's the same in both tanks, <clears throat> but the tank on the right has higher pressure nitrogen, so you can have a smaller tank. More pressure means we can push that, that agent further. Longer pipe runs, possibly smaller pipe sizes. There's opportunities possibly for halon replacement um, as well as multi-systems, uh, multi-valve systems uh, zones and so forth. So it really provides, the higher pressures do provide some unique opportunities on the design side. And again, it could be beneficial to your customer. Smaller pipe size and a smaller cost. Or they may say, you know what, I really want to put those tanks in a location 100 feet down the hallway. With some of the lower pressure systems, we may not be able to do that, but with the higher pressure systems, we may. Here's an example of a multi-zone system. And what I mean by that is you have one bank of system cylinders protecting multiple spaces and um, activating the system and discharging the agent into each zone or, or the zone that actually is, is calling for it. So again, multi-zone selector valves often Come coincide with some of the higher pressure systems. Small space protection. Again, I, I've seen a spike in, in requests for small bottle systems like this. They're compact, pre-engineered systems. You can see, you know, three pound, seven pound, 14 pound cylinders. Um, th they may or may not, a lot of times they're used because there's no electrical requirement to activate them. You do want a uh, to you certainly want to monitor them, uh, monitor them to make sure that you're monitoring the uh, pressure inside those cylinders. Um, but there's no necessarily uh, need for electrical activation of these systems. We see them a lot in these applications, electrical uh, cabinets and so forth, uh, control boxes, CNC machines is a big one, um, and even fume hoods. We're seeing more use of that. And these these small bottles typically you see them with. Um, 
uh, Novec 1230, FM 200, uh, or even CO2 uh, in these type of cylinders. This is how they work. Primarily, there's a couple different options, but ultimately your detection is that red tubing. If there's a fire in the space, that red tubing is pressurized, it melts, creates an opening, pressure is relieved, allows that valve to open and discharge the agent from the nozzle. And at the same time, um, there's there are other systems out there. Like I said, I encourage you always to look at the manufacturers and what they have. But some cases you can even even get these where you don't have an additional pipe and no nozzle. You actually discharge the agent out of the hole that's created um, from the fire and allows that agent to to attack right where that fire is is, is in existence. So it's, again, small spaces, uh, a little bit more unique from the everyday thing that we deal with. And I, I think lastly is in cabinet protection. Um, we see a lot of data centers getting smaller and smaller. We see a lot of um, information piling up into these racks, these 19 inch racks, um, self-cooled type racks. There is actually systems out there and there's multiple manufacturers out there that provide an in cabinet uh, clean agent protection built in with the agent as well as detection, whether it's air sampling or a actual smoke detector built right inside. Um, but again, it's that in cabinet type protection, uh, similar to that small bottle that we looked at earlier, but this physically slides right into that that rack and it almost looks like a, a piece of equipment. So it's it's really cool. All right, so, um, I am also involved with the FSSA, I mentioned it earlier, the Fire Suppression Systems Association. And a lot of the information um, that you need to know, whether it's the guides that you see on the right, there's a, a number of um, FSSA design guides uh, for different applications, whether it's CO2, whether it's pipe design handbook, detection and controls, and the NFPA standards reference the FSSA guides and quite a few of those NFPA standards. So they're written by an amazing technical team. Uh, they're extremely knowledgeable um, and uh, they do a great job building those guides as well as the online training that I mentioned earlier. Um, the, uh, you know, they also do a lot of webinars. They have an annual forum. It's a great association. Uh, and I just thought it was important because we're talking specifically about special hazards, this is the group that you want to be involved in is the Fire Suppression Systems Association. Um, and you can get more information on that website at uh, fssa.net. So that's my little plug for the FSSA. And with that, um, that's all I have today. So hopefully you guys have taken something from this presentation. Um, you know, I, I know we kind of touched a little bit on a bunch of things, uh, but hopefully there was some uh, good information for you. And I don't know if there's any uh, questions that have come in at all. Um, Jennifer, you you with us? Is yep. there any any questions? Yep. Yep. Thank you so much for, for that, Todd. Um, we have a, a good amount of questions that have come in. Um, one of the questions was, and you kind of touched on this um, on the uh, the ITM slide, um, but one of the questions that came in was, does installing the special hazard system lock you into that ITM contract? And then kind of piggybacking on that, can you service another system that was installed by another contractor? Oh, sure. Throw a hardball on the first one. Straight up the gate. No, that is a, a great question, and it does come up a lot. Um, I guess the first thing is, I, I don't believe, it does not lock you in. Um, if you're a distributor of a certain product line that you purchase and install and sell to a customer, um, that customer ultimately at that point owns that equipment, right? So it's up to them to properly maintain it. Um, and it should be up to them to make sure that the individual maintaining it is an authorized distributor of that equipment. However, in each state and region and that sort of thing, there's always more than one distributor of that product line. Um, so hopefully that answered the question. It really doesn't, as a, as a contractor, it certainly helps um, because you know, you've installed that equipment, you're familiar with it. Hopefully you've developed a good relationship with that customer and you can carry on that 
that service contract, but there are other contractors that are distributors that could also do the inspection. And as far as the other side of it, um, you know, ag again, it's a little bit of a touchy situation um, with the different manufacturers and so forth. And, and I would probably tend to go back and, and say that to reach out to the, the manufacturer of that product and, and ask that question and what their guidelines are. But again, as I did mention, it is important to be aware of what that product is that you're inspecting. Um, and, you know, again, if you're not a authorized distributor, you really need to look at getting some information on that equipment. So hopefully that helped. No, that was great. Um, we have another question. Um, you mentioned several um, several times in a couple places where you can get training. Um, would you be able to repeat some of those um, training options that are available to um, to everybody that's on today and then just available in general for, for people? Sure, and I just backed it up one slide. Um, again, the FSSA training program through FSSA.net is really specifically to special hazards. This is where you're going to find everything you need, um, uh, or at least an extreme amount of what you need. Uh, so FSSA.net, that's that's one of the training programs. And I mentioned, again, NICET certifications. Again, a lot of us are familiar with those NICET, N-I-C-E-T I believe it's NICET.org. Um, don't quote me on that, I apologize, but the NICET certifications are also very helpful. There's one in inspection, testing, and maintenance. There's a certification in special hazards. There's a certification in fire alarm, as well as a certification for uh, sprinkler. So, um, you know, those are, I think, the key ones that, you're, that you want to look into. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, is this, um, another question too, is all of this also applicable to Canada? Or would it vary um, based in the US and Canada? Well, if we have any Canadian folks listening, welcome. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, uh, great to have you, eh? Uh, the, I don't know, obviously, I don't know the Canadian requirements as far as um, the rules and regulations of being a licensed uh, sprinkler, uh, special hazard contractor or anything like that. Um, but again, I think the principles of what I'm sharing with everybody is the same. The type of manufacturers, they do have other requirements in Canada. They have, we have DOT, Department of Transportation. All of our cylinders need to be DOT certified. In Canada, they use TC, which is Transport Canada. So the equipment itself may be a little different, the, the, the um, approvals, if you will. But for the most part, most of the equipment that we did discuss is, is sold really worldwide. Um, and again, those training programs would definitely still be um, compatible to uh, Canadian uh, you know, requirements and such. All right, perfect. All right, so we've got one here. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a longer one here, but um, so in the Novak uh, 1230 cylinder, they see three weights, full weight, empty weight and agent weight. If you're weighing on a weighing scale and it give and it gives you the total weight which is five pounds less, then <clears throat> then how can you determine whether what was lost was the nitrogen or the agent? If you if 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 the weight of the tank is less um you don't always you're not always gonna know if it's the nitrogen or the agent. Um, okay. If you if if the weight itself of the tank is less, um, ultimately the gauge that's on there as well is probably going to show to be lower as well. And ultimately, there is some different conversation there. Again, it's kind of a, a, a hardball because some manufacturers will tell you that you would never lose agent based on the way a tank is filled. It would always be the nitrogen. <clears throat> I've talked to other people that have they've argued against that and said, no, there is a possibility of losing agent and not lose nitrogen. So, um, you know, with experience, you know, if, if the gauge is low, uh, the tank is low, we're going to top it off with some nitrogen and it should bring it back into uh, dial it back in. But if there's really a concern that you th you're losing a lot of weight over time, you definitely want to do some further investigation in that. Wait, and then let me see. I think we've got one more. 
Um, and the question is, um, has the has ITM for special hazards been affected in the last couple of months? Well, we uh, at <clears throat> at FSSA, uh, we've been doing what we call these town hall meetings for our members, and it's been a great process where we're getting together as members, we're having Zoom meetings, we're all looking at each other on the screen and smiling and and chatting and really just sharing ideas or, or sharing experiences of what we're been up against with COVID-19. And what I've learned over the last couple months, talking to the FSSA members, the installer members, and the, the manufacturer members, everybody's being affected differently. Ultimately, we have seen a, a, a small dip, I think, in the beginning with ITMs, but that small dip um, that, that dropped because of, of closing of buildings, well, that inspection doesn't go away. You still need to get it done. So now instead of, it, it may have went away for the month of, let's say, April, but now we're in June and things are picking back up, that work still has to get completed. So now it's just making for a larger, uh, over, more overloaded June and July, if that makes sense. Yep. yep. So, and of course, you know, with Inspect Point and the software that you guys offer, uh, that's obviously very helpful to um, manage the, that process as well and, and make sure that you're keeping up with all your customers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was a good enough plug or not. No, that was great. Thank you for that. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Um, well, that's all the questions that we have. Um, okay. We have a couple nice little notes. We want to thank everybody for being here. Thank a lot of notes coming or messages coming in for thanking you, Todd, for, for today's presentation. Um, thank you. If anyone does think of any questions after the fact, feel free to, to email myself. Um, Todd's information is also up on the screen um, as well. So if there's any questions, anything, um, please do not hesitate to, to reach out. Um, a recording of this will be emailed out to everyone within the within the next hour or so. So um, if you have any questions, and, and like I said, you're like, hold on, I want to look at that one slide again, um, you'll be able to reference it as well. Um, but I just do want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you again, Todd, um, for today's presentation and all this great information. Um, and like I said, keep your eyes peeled for a recording and any questions, do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Have a good day, everyone.